I'm Emily Day, and this is an episode from the Lawfare Archives for December 11th, 2021. On December 8th, the Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit found that information collected from warrantless surveillance of non-United States persons living abroad did not violate the constitutional rights of Jamshed Mutarov. The opinion ruled that the surveillance of Mutarov under Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act was reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. Section 702 is a highly controversial statute that allows the NSA to conduct dragnet warrantless surveillance of non-U.S. persons outside the country. To delve deeper into Section 702, I chose an episode from June 3, 2017, in which Matt Olson talks about the intelligence community's perspective on 702 and what lies ahead for it. I'm Quinta Jurassic, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, June 3rd, 2017. On December 31st, 2017, Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, a central component of U.S. intelligence gathering and national security for the last decade, will sunset unless renewed by Congress. This week at the Hoover Institution, Benjamin Wittes sat down with former director of the National Counterterrorism Center, Matt Olson, to talk about the intelligence community's perspective on 702, what may lie ahead for the program in the midst of an ever more dysfunctional political climate, and whether and how the government would be able to handle 702's lapse. It's the Lawfare Podcast, Episode 230, Matt Olson on the future of Section 702. Let me start, Matt, by... Just uh, asking you on a scale of 1 to 10, how important is 702 to U.S. counterterrorism mission and to other national security interests and and, and, and what other interests? So if I can uh, channel uh, the movie Spinal Tap, I'll say 11. Uh, for those of you who've seen the movie. Um, so, you know, this go- the amplifier goes to 11. And <clears throat> on the scale of 1 to 10, uh, you know, it's, you know, in all seriousness, it's very important. Um, the, and, I, and I'll go back to introductions for a second. First of all, it's great to be here with you, Ben. And Ben and I have had a lot of conversations uh, about these issues over the, over the years, although I, ben, as Ben and I ben mentioned, we didn't really caucus before, so I'm a little nervous about what Ben's going to throw at me. Um, and since he, he kind of said, oh, we don't need to talk. We'll just have a conversation. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Um, so, um, and, and I did move around a bit uh, in government, and as Ben sort of euphemistically puts it, I had a diverse experiences with 702. If The truth is I just kept moving every couple of years. Every time there was some kind of issue or problem, I just moved on to the next job and let somebody after me deal with <laughs> MCTs, for example, um, or other things, uh, the other difficult issues that, that have come up. Because there are issues, and I know we'll talk about those. Um, but, you know, back to your question, um, you know, from uh, at, at the National Counterterrorism Center, I was uh, the recipient of 702 information, as we called it. Um, and it was really actually having worked on it from, a, from the perspective of in 2008 and 2007, uh, getting, the, getting the authority, it was oddly gratifying to sit around with a room of, of analysts at NCTC and, and they would say, uh, and we you know, we know from 702 information that, you know, X, Y, and Z. And I thought, you know, it's not very often that analysts would actually talk about the authority by which we knew uh, a particular fact. But there was something about 702 that was, I think, you know, sort of special. Um, one, it was called out in the Signet report. Typically, it would be called out as the source of 702, but it was also often the case um, because of special handling around it that it would be part of the in- intelligence information that our analysts were getting. Um, or maybe they just knew I worked on it and they were sucking up to me. So that was also <laughs> possible, I guess. But the, the reality was um, that it was, it, it, you know, the statistics that are out there from PCLOB, it's, you know, a, you know, a major contributor to the president's daily brief, it is a. If, if I don't know if there's a if, a if there's a more important source of information for terrorism information, single source, than uh, or single authority providing uh, a source of information in 702. So okay. it's hard to overstate. Okay, so so let's break it down now. Um, the reason <clears throat> the program is so important, presumably, is that it solves a problem that otherwise doesn't have a solution. And so <clears throat> we always talk about 702 as though it's just something that exists out there. It actually has only existed since 
well, in current form since 2008, right? Uh, temporarily, it existed in, 2000, in a statute in 2007. So what's the problem that 702 is the solution to? It's a, it's a couple problems uh, that it solves. Uh, and it is, uh, you know, it is important, I think, to understand 702 to, to really do a little bit of historical um, discussion. And, and uh, the prior uh, presentation talked a little bit about this as well. Um, but the, the, the basic problem is it has to do with the nature of FISA generally, the sort of the, the landmark. FISA statute from 1978, and, and the fact that, like in a lot of contexts, the law that was passed in 1978 didn't keep up with changes in technology. Um, so there were, the, the, and the way FISA works really is the scope of what you can do under FISA is defined by the definition of electronic surveillance. That is the jurisdictional basis for what uh, the FISA court can authorize in terms of uh, electronic surveillance for foreign intelligence collection. Uh, and uh, what that definition uh, was adopted in 1978 based on the technology of 1978, um, where most of long-distance communications were carried by radio communications. So there's lots of technically technology-based uh, language in the definition of electronic surveillance, which defines the scope of FISA. That changed uh, fundamentally in the in the 90s and 2000s, so that um, the, most of those communications were then carried over fiber optic cable or a wire as the definition uh, uses the term wire and that meant that instead of being able to collect that information without go collect information here's the important part collect information where we were targeting non-US persons who were not in the United States who typically don't have fourth amendment rights instead of being able to do that without a probable cause warrant we were having we being the justice department and the agency NSA or FBI we were having to go to the FISA court and get probable cause uh, on an individualized basis. So, fundamental problem, changes in technology meant uh, people who didn't have Fourth Amendment rights were getting Fourth Amendment rights essentially by virtue of the government having to establish probable cause that they were an agent of a foreign power under FISA. Um, it was an enormous resource drain. I oversaw that program at Justice in 2006 and 2007. Uh, yeah, just thousands of person hours devoted to getting a uh, FISA, a probable cause FISA, on a non-U.S. person in Yemen uh, who was generally communicating with other non-U.S. persons in Yemen and, and, and places around there. Um, but we were developing these packages that were an inch thick to prove that they were an agent of a foreign power. Um, that that was a resource drain, but it was also, you know, it didn't make much sense because they didn't have Fourth Amendment rights, and we, we thought it, it made sense, from a, especially from a terrorism perspective, to have a more agile means of obtaining their communications when we needed to, and this is an important point, use a U.S.-based service provider because it, we needed a mechanism under FISA to uh, compel uh, their uh, compliance as well as to protect them legally when they pl provided that information to the government. That's a long answer, but that's kind of the, the nature of the problem. Okay, so I want to shorten it. Okay. Um, yeah, if, that's not the that's not the that's not the that's not the sound the bite, CNN right? sound bite. No, but I want yeah. I, I want to sort of isolate what it is because we're going to get to the problem in a minute of what happens if you turn off seven hundred two, and I and I want to I, I want to focus on like what's you know what what problem you are solving with it that you then stop solving if all of a sudden, say, on December 31st, uh, it ceases to be law, or January 1st. Uh, and as I understand what you said, uh, it is that large numbers uh, of lawful intelligence targets overseas communicating with other terrorist and non-terrorist lawful surveillance target overseas but whose communications are routing through the United States would suddenly have to go through conventional FISA and thus be subject to wildly increased standards of a sort that we've never decided as a society we want to give to, you know, aliens beyond the shores of the United States. Is that, is that fair? That's fair. All right. What's the, what kind of numbers are we talking about? So I, I, with the specific numbers are classified. So let's, let's use big round, uh, I think the, the, the government says there are a few thousand conventional FISA warrants a year. I forget the exact number in the United States 
most years. Ballpark, where's the decimal point when we're talking about how many overseas targets might suddenly become subject to FISA if you turned off 702? And, and so, and assume that all of those same targets were now you were able to demonstrate probable cause and. and, and yeah, l- 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 let's let's assume let, let's assume you could do it. Yeah, right. I mean, like, which in fact is counterfactual. But let's assume let's assume there's X number of people overseas that you we now you surveil under 702 without an individual priv- probable cause showing. And uh, those are the universe of people you actually want to target right, right. Uh, for surveillance. And now you have to do it under FISA, which we're doing, I don't know, 2,000 or something a year. Uh, how, what, what, what are we talking about? So, and and the, the number of actual FISAs, I think, is around 2,000. And yeah, that number so is specifically some, reported uh, right. by the government. The, the number, you know, I don't... I don't. So this is an issue. I don't know if if that number, if the broader number, is public. I think it, there's some, been some in the hundred thousand. I thought that's right. I thought I saw that. And so it's orders of magnitude, right? I mean, it's so it's uh, a factor of fifty greater. And in your rough guess, how many of those people targets could you get a conventional FISA against? And that there's two dimensions to that problem. There is could you establish probable cause right. and could you amass the resources to, you know, go through those steps? Leave and the resource question aside. For resource now. question aside, boy, I, um, you know, I, the, just a, a gut feel about the numbers that would meet the standard would be certainly under 50 percent um, and maybe, you know, in the, you know, under 20 percent. Okay, so you're dealing with, let me just summarize this. Hugely important program, 11 on a scale of 1 to 10, um, major contributor to the president's daily brief, uh, and if you uh, turn it off, you have to scale by a factor of 50 the uh, number of people that you are subjecting to conventional FISA, and uh, for more than half of them, you couldn't do it, and for the half that you could do it, you're, uh, you're dealing with uh, a, an intense resource allocation. Is that a fair summary? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. that's right. And, and maybe, you know, insurmountable resource, I mean, beyond intense. Okay, so here's, uh, before we turn to the politics of this, I'm just trying to establish the, the scale of the problem here uh, that the political system is about to confront. Um, what did we do before 2007? You know, we, this is a new solution to this problem, right? Um, you know, FISA, the, the problem actually predates 702. What were we doing? How were we handling it before we had the particular solution that we now have? And why couldn't we just go back to that? So, you know, there's a... Uh... So what, you know, you go back, what I talked about before, you could go back 20 years, right? And you just, the problem was on, on the scale because of the technology issue that I described. You didn't, it wasn't... It, because person A in Botswana and person B in Yemen, when they were communicating, were not communicating through a server in the United that's States. That's right, that's right, exactly. And so, um, and that's, you know, that's still true for a lot of those same individuals. But the fact of the matter is many of those... Many of that, m- 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 many of those communications do now pass through the United States or through a U.S.-based service provider, um, and and so the problem really didn't exist to the same degree if you go back twenty years, maybe ten years. Um, then, of course, you have the terrorist surveillance program. So, two thousand one to two thousand, you know, um, I guess as I recall, seven. Um, when the government announced that, you know, there, that what in any electronic surveillance that had been conducted under uh, what was then had been revealed as a terror surveillance program was now being conducted under the FISA court. Um, so you had a, a regime that was based on Article Two um, authorities and, and a, you know, and a, and a controversial legal interpretation. Um, so then, so that, so that, if you go back that far, that's what you go back to in terms of legal authority. Um, uh, so, you know, if, 
and, and then now if you were to, if you were to turn off 702 and just say okay now you got to go back and just cover these same individuals under probable cause finding under FISA we'd go back to sort of the brute force efforts that were undertaken when I was there to 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 try to uh, cover as many of those individuals non-US citizens overseas non-US persons overseas uh, simply with uh, title 1 FISA and and you know, and then the same problem we just talked about in terms of resources and establishing probable cause. So, in the absence of 702, you basically have a bifurcated set of options: either a robust and maybe unsustainable assertion of Article II authority to just kind of do it on the president's own authority, or uh, you do it person by person uh, under uh, under conventional FISA. Right. All right. Let's talk about the politics of this thing, because uh, FISA 702 has a has a expiration tag on it, um, and uh, it's not the first time that the authority has expired, but it is the first time the authority has expired in the context of a political environment quite as uh, difficult as this one, and so we are now six months out before 702 turns into a pumpkin. Uh, how do you understand the politics of reauthorization? Yeah, so it's interesting. The, the prior presentation, one of the questions I think at the end was uh, what was the vote or what, uh, in 2012. So I was sitting here and I Googled it and it was, um, I think the Senate was like 73 votes for reauthorization in 2012. Similar proportion in, in the House. So, you know, at least by the time it, was December 20th, you know, looming deadline of January 1, uh, it was bipartisan support um, for uh, reauthorization in 2012. Um, and that, you know, going back to 2012, I was in, at NC NCTC at the time, um, we were very, very, you know, cl closely following this issue. And this was, um, this was at a time where there was, you know, the Tea Party sort of movement had begun in Congress. So there was we had started to see a change from when I worked on the legislation in 2008, where you had a sort of libertarian streak in the Republican Party that was kind of joined with, uh, uh, you know, sort of critics on the left to, and, and privacy uh, uh, groups on the left to question some of this, right? Um, so that that had started to happen in 2012, and obviously that those those um, dynamics are still in play today, but. You know, I do think that it's fun. There is does, does feel like there's something that's changed from 2012 that's going to make this harder. Um, okay, so let's let's before we turn to the unique particularities of the current situation, of which I can think of at least three. Let's let's just talk about the general constellation of forces here. You've traditionally had a core center right of center and je and left of center support for these authorities and you've had a dissenting left civil liberties community uh, and you've had a more marginal libertarian right objection. Uh, my sense generally speaking is that even before this year that dissent on the right has grown in strength mm -hmm. and i'm i'm uh, you know i'm i'm interested in your sense of when you think about the the politics of you know who who are the opponents of 702 how much do you think of sort of conventional left opponents you know the sort of aclu uh and how much do you think of it as a as a sort of sagebrush rebellion Tea Party thing. So that's, you know, so I don't, I don't, you know, I think. Let me answer that question by going back to two thousand eight. So if you think about um, the law as it was passed in two thousand, first the Protect America Act, and then the, and then seven hundred two in two thousand eight, that was at a t that was passed at a time that you had a very unpopular president, uh, Republican president, President Bush. You had Dem Democrats controlling both houses of Congress. And as, and as a result, I think, um, the, the law that was passed represented a, a, a pretty thoughtful balance uh, of the various viewpoints on how to, uh, how to protect the country and protect privacy, you know, the basic, the basic challenge of building a statute 
that gave the intelligence community the agility, speed uh, to collect vital intelligence while building in a number of safeguards involving the FISA court um, being, you know, the targeting procedures, the minimization procedures, Fourth Amendment considerations. The FISA court has authority over all of those, the oversight mechanisms built in. So all the things we learned about, you know, an hour ago um, were all part of this uh, hard-fought compromise uh, where, you know, the, 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 these groups, this was not like a, a law that was shoved down the throat of, by one party over the other, given the, the, the nature of the, the executive branch and Congress. Um, so I think that's important as you think about the current, you know, the current state of play. Um, and, I, and I guess one point to make, I think, Ben, in, in response is that I don't think, my own sense is, you know, when you talk about the critics, I don't think there really is much real debate about the fundamentals of 702. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm naive or hopeful, but the value of it and the sort of core principles of how it works, you know, I don't think, I think there is general support for that. I think there's obviously some critics uh, of the law on, the, on some of the, you know, on some aspects of it. But I think those aspects are on the fringes of how it's used as opposed to the core of not uh, not requiring you know the government to get probable cause to establish probable cause for non u s persons overseas to collect foreign intelligence that seems to me to be pretty broadly accepted right, so I agree with that with the following caveat that I think you can you can accept that broad principle and then caveat the broad principle so often and so uh and so uh neurotically that you end up eroding the underlying principle itself and creating effectively a lot of the workload burden that the uh, that the statute was designed to, to eliminate. But okay, if we accept that there is a core reservoir of support here that is strong, uh, what's changed? I mean, you you, yeah. you you just said you think this year is going to be harder than than 2012. I share that, and I also note that the aggregate legislative progress that we've seen to, toward reauthorization so far has been something close to zero. Right. Um, and moreover, there's another intervening event that I think is disturbing which is the uh, Protect America Act 215 debate, which it's a different subject, but it also kind of flows out of the Snowden revelations. And that bill was ferociously contested. The program was actually allowed to lapse for a while. And, um, you know, I don't think the legislative process associated with that was a harbinger of anything attractive with respect to uh, what's likely to happen to, to 702. So I'm I'm interested what you see as the current legislative politics that are different from the politics uh, four or five years ago. So I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll take a shot at that. I mean, it's not really I, I, you're closer and better at knowing the, the politics, I think, than I am, Ben, in some ways. I mean, I, I, I read the papers and try to stay up on this, but I, I'm not I wouldn't hold myself out as an expert on the political um, political landscape on this. But I. My own sense is, I mean, there's some big things that changed since 2012. 2012 was harder than 2008 in a way, which is sort of odd because of the sort of the libertarian sort of, you know, streak in Congress that, cre that had some critics on the right, which we didn't have in 2008. That was the, the, the support of the right was kind of a given in going into 2008. So 2012 was harder. Then the big things are Snowden, 2013. Uh, we are still, you know, if I ask this Group. I, I'm sure people won't raise hands, but how many people believe that uh, NSA is uh, is has, is tapping directly into the central servers of several U.S.-based internet providers? I suspect m many people would say yes, that's true because that was the lead story in the Washington Post um, shortly after the uh, after the Snowden revelations. Turns out not to be true, not true at all, and really knowingly, knowably not true at the time. That article was written. That and the Post has still, to this day, never run a correction it, about it. They got a Pulitzer Prize for it. 
Um, you know, I find that to be pretty problematic, right? I mean, I knew when I read it, I was like, wait, that's not true. In fact, we just, we had a very open public congressional debate where we established the authority to be able to do this, and it wasn't NSA tapping directly into the central servers of Google and Yahoo. Um, so, um, but it was on a slide that was in the Snowden, uh, you know, it was on a, power, a training slide, apparently. Um, so, so Snowden, so yeah, don't get me started on this, right, obviously. Right, so we got um, Snowden. Right, so we got Snowden. Um, thank you for pulling me back from the brink. Um, so we have Snowden, that's, and, and you know, in some ways, a lot of that, I think, has run its course, is my sense. I mean, look, I, there were the, 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 you brought up the 215 debate. That obviously was the sort of the, the most controversial aspect of what Snowden re, uh, revealed, and, and, and that's been largely addressed. Um, I feel like, you know, much of that is sort of dissipated. Uh, but still, it still informs the current uh, current climate, I think. Um, but then, you look, you're, you're not going to say President Trump, so I will say President Trump. Ben's oh, I was going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, today, so there's a tweet from the president. Um, the real story is uh, unmasking and surveillance of U.S. persons, uh, something to that effect. Um, that's the real story. Uh, and that is something that we just haven't seen before. Uh, that we have what in yeah, particular? What, what in particular? Is it we is seen so. Before. It is the it, yeah right. So it's an, it's a number of different facets of this same thing, but it's a a strong uh, message coming out of the White House of distrust of the intelligence community, uh, and and that comes out in particular comes out in you know uh, in comments about surveillance. You know, going back. Uh, to general distrust around the Russian story that goes back, you know, to you know pre-inauguration, uh, to the you know false statements about being that from the president that he was subject to surveillance uh, by the by President Obama, um, to comments by uh, Chairman Nunez about you know potentially illegal unmasking. So this creates an atmosphere of of distrust of what the intelligence community does. And you see, you know, you, it seems to me, you see sort of cynically people who know better, I think, on the right, embracing those views to support the political position that the president has uh, taken. So let's... Let, let's so that's, that's the best I can say about that. And there are a lot of folks in here who probably know this issue and know this better than I do, but that's so, my but, sense. But let's break that down, because I think you, you raised two issues that are interrelated, but I think discrete from one another. So one is, one is the, the messaging from the president uh, alleging illegal use of surveillance authorities and illegal unmasking of people. Um, traditionally, we have relied on the executive branch not merely not to engage in illegal wiretapping with either however many spaces, however, you know, between wire and tapping. Um, not merely not to engage in it, but to be the explainer of the legality of the intelligence community's behavior. And I, I think it does create a very difficult environment when the president is saying things that are that we would regard as people like me anyway would regard as wildly irresponsible if say the ACLU said them which by the way the ACLU wouldn't right. um, and um, and so I'm I'm I don't really understand how the executive branch under the circumstances in which it is accusing itself of unlawful behavior on a day-to-day -day basis, goes to Congress and asks for renewal of these authorities. And I don't really understand how a reasonable member of Congress under those circumstances, uh, whether they believe the president or not, if you believe the president, then the intelligence community is doing these things. Uh, it seems kind of nuts to invest it with these authorities, right? And if you don't believe the president, the the, the president's tweets and comments about these things, uh, it seems uh, it's a hot, tough sell to invest him with these authorities. And so I'm 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 left with a, a, a as as a fervent supporter of these authorities. I'm left with a real perplexity as to how you how you react as a legislative body to the executive systematically accusing itself of misconduct. 
So that's, I think, a really good way to pose the dilemma, uh, because I agree with both of those. Uh, and I, on the first, you know, does, do, does, the, does, does Congress really believe uh, that the intelligence community is doing the things that the president is saying? I think that the answer, by and large, is no. And, I think, and, I think and, there's a parallel universe, right? And, and just to be clear, do you believe a word of it? No. I mean, no, not in the not in the, the things I said. The you know illegal the, surveillance, the illegal surveillance, yeah. un, evil unmasking conspiracies in yeah. which you know. Uh, I, I, so, so, so you believe? Just for the record, I believe, but I'm just want to clarify this. You believe that the intelligence community is using its authority lawfully and the president is misrepresenting the conduct of his own intelligence community. Yes. And, you know, I'd say that not just as a casual observer, but as a former general counsel at NSA and as a, you know, as a, an official at NCTC. Um, now, which is to be, to be careful, right, there are the, the NSA, FBI, uh, DOJ make mistakes. And there are compliance incidents, and we, we know that that happens. And you know, the court, as some of those are quite public, some are not known, um, or at least not as not publicly known in terms of their specific nature. So it's not to say it's, it, the system is perfect, but the things that the president is saying, I, you know, I've reason, I, I believe are not true, and in my own experience are not true. Okay, so the, so, pre the president isn't the only one who's saying them. Another person who is saying the same thing is the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. Now, this strikes me as another, uh, a, a, another very peculiar element of the discussion, that this is a committee that is both an oversight body, but also a body that's supposed to you know, be able to say, hey, what's, what is and is not uh, happening. And in the past, the intelligence committee leadership have, particularly during the Snowden revelations, so even very recently, have played this very important role of saying, hey, we've been fully briefed on program X and we have confidence in the legality and appropriateness of the agency's behavior under X circumstances. And, um, but here you have a situation in which the chairman of the Intelligence Committee goes to the White House to... Uh, I, I have trouble even quite understanding what he purported to do, but to receive a bunch of information, then to release a bunch of information, uh, all of which was about, in some sense, these um, uh, alleged misuse of, you know, an unmasking of presumably lawfully collected either 702 or conventional FISA material. This leads to his recusal from the Russia matter. Um, but immediately upon that happening, there was discussion in the intelligence committees of what this means for 702 reauthorization. Does it get harder? Um, seems to me that makes the environment much, much more challenging, yeah? <clears throat> sure, yeah. I mean, every, I mean it goes, going back a step, you know, everything's harder right now, right? Everything is harder. So it's harder to see the, uh, a nonpartisan sort of... Uh, treatment of an uh, intelligence authorization bill, uh, you know, a bill that uh, authorizes this, this authority. Um, I do think that the, I mean, look, the Nunez episode, which I, I think is just, it does make it harder, but I don't think it is representative of at all what the, the rest of uh, the intelligence committees, particularly when you include the Senate Intelligence Committee, um, you include the rest of the House Intelligence Committee in, in particular, um, you know, ranking member Adam Schiff, like they're, there, there, that, this is not his experience. That, again, I think it was sort of an isolated episode. I agree with you. I, ne the idea of the of, of the chairman of the House and Intelligence Committee going to the White House is not in my experience. Like that doesn't happen. That is a very odd, strange thing for him to do. Um, and there's a big difference if, if you compare how you know what he is, what he said, what uh, Chairman Nunez said to what. Um, Chairman Mike Rogers said, when in the, in the aftermath of the Snowden investigation, to your point of sort of how the intelligence committees react um, to what the intelligence community is doing. So all of which is to kind of agree with you that, there, that this has made it harder. I don't, I, I wouldn't, the Nunez episode, I, I don't know how much stock to put in that is something that's really changed the dynamic. 
But if I could go back to something else you said before, Ben, which is I think you're right. Like, it's a good observation. Like, if you, be, if you don't think what the president is saying is true, then how do you vest him with these additional authorities, right? That becomes like this right. real dilemma for people. And I'll put myself in, the, in that position of who worked on this authority, sort of, um, you know, trying to imagine sort of dangerous people or di- difficult situations in terms of who's in the White House, but not necessarily anticipating somebody like uh, Donald Trump. Um, so one answer to that is to, um, is to, is 702, I think, reflects a law that has, a, that has substantial uh, oversight and compliance mechanisms built in so that it is, it, it, it would not be, you know, I think you can look at it and think this would be very difficult for a president acting, you know, sort of on his own accord to abuse this authority because of the, the, the fact that all three branches of government are directly involved in, its, in overseeing how it's, how it's used. So there's one other big, seems to me, legislative impediment other than the general atmosphere of congressional dysfunction, which is something we haven't talked about but is a, is a background condition that's serious. And that is, at least speaking personally, I don't know who's going to quarterback this thing. I, you know, during the, the, in 2008, I knew exactly who was quarterbacking 702, the creation of 702. And I, I, you know, I knew who was doing the work and I knew who had the clout to do the work. Um, in 2012, I knew who had the clout to do the work, right? Who was, who was, but right now I look at it and I say, all right, the president not merely doesn't have the focus, doesn't understand the issue. He's actively tweeting that the authorities are being misused, right? The, uh, the FBI director has been removed, um, and the DNI is not, at least as I can tell, sort of highly energized and sort of being, being the person who's going to drive this train. Uh, so my question is, wh- who's the quarterback of this thing? Wh- wh- where's the energy between now and the end of December going to come to get from to get this thing done? Lawfare, you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So in two thousand eight, just for the record, yeah. I did not put him up yeah. to that. <laughs> Um, 2008, it, it, yeah, it was it was a it, the, the White House was fully behind it, and 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 it was you know Director of, uh, McConnell, Mike McConnell, the DNI, the Attorney General, a- and um, Ben Powell, and, and, and the lawyers behind them, yeah. right? Ben Powell at, at DNI, especially. Um, 2012, it, similarly, it was sort of a uh, it was also the DNI and the Justice Department together. Um, so and and now, so you don't have anyone at NS, NSD. Yet, so there's there's not political leadership there. Um, it's 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 hard to know, you know, where this where the. I, so I'm basically agreeing with you. Like it's hard to see where the sort of center of gravity is. Now that doesn't mean it won't come around. I know, I think even as of last year, the Justice Department was uh, starting to to put pull together the effort a bit. I, I I you know I know folks there were thinking about looking ahead to 2017, um, but the uh, and and direct. Director Coates certainly has the ability and the sort of infrastructure in place, and especially given his role uh, on the Senate Intelligence Committee, can you know he he understands the issues. I think it's a matter of making this a priority and and understanding the importance of this and saying okay, this is of the three things we're going to work on this year, because that's how we did it in 2008. You know, you just pick a couple of things and you just decide this is what you're going to work on, um, and I think that's the kind of effort that will need to take place. So one, one optimistic way to think about this is that, you know, the old phrase that there's nothing like a hanging to concentrate the mind, right? And, and that as you get into the fall, uh, the, you know, my, my colleague Susan Hennessy always, always says going dark on 702 for even 24 hours is a national security emergency of the first order. And that as you get toward that actually happening, um, people will focus and a lot of extraneous stuff that seems like a real impediment now will fall away because it has to get done and it would be like a government shutdown. It has to not happen so it won't happen, except of course sometimes they happen. Um, What are other reasons 
that you can think of to be less pessimistic than the last few minutes of conversation would lead one to be? Well, I'm, I'm actually not that pessimistic. I mean, okay, as, so much, why? Yeah, as much as the, the dynamic is difficult, I, because, I mean, one, I, what I said, I do think that there is broad consensus around the, the core. Like, I agree with you that you can chip away at it and make it, make it almost operationally difficult to use to the same degree, but I don't, I still, I think that the, uh, the experience that we've had with, uh, with 702 since 2008 has created a general consensus that there's true value in, in the way it works and not a lot of criticism about the, the core um, principles or core provisions. Um, and I, I guess that's one, I guess, too, is that, there, you know, as much as there are people who are very suspicious, rightly, you know, who are, you know, skeptical of government abuse of this authority, there really aren't concrete examples of it being abused. Like, if you ask folks who have real concerns, okay, show me where there's been a problem, um, you know, that's of a, of a serious nature. Look, compliance issues, and some of them are, are important or significant, but not, I think, some of the real abuses. Nothing like, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the abuses of the 70s, for example, anything on that, on that order. So generally been, and as, as PCLOB found, right, the, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board found that had been, the, the law had been uh, implemented, uh, you know, with, with thoughtfully and, and, and rigorously. So, so those are, are you know, I, so that's one reason to be optimistic. Now, having said that, if I were uh, going to be the, the DNI general counsel or the head of NSD, I would not make uh, Christmas vacation or, you know, <laughs> winter, winter break plans. I would, I would assume, yeah, I would not plan to go skiing then. I would think you are going to be, there's, this is going to come down to the wire. That typically, that's what happens when these, with these sunsets. Um, they do tend to come down to the last few minutes and deals are brokered. Um, I would think there, there might, and there's some, I guess another reason to be optimistic is I think there are some areas where there can be some compromise that will give uh, people who have concerns uh, a greater degree of confidence around transparency. And okay. so, so that's so, another reason to be somewhat uh, so bef optimistic. Before we, I want to I have you spell out a little bit of that areas of co possible compromise. But before we do that, uh, one thing about 702 is that it is not an on-off switch, right? I mean, if, 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 if you were still agency general counsel and you thought and you get to there's some date after which you say hey if we're not sure we have to uh we're going to have this come january one we have to start winding it down now right we have to start making contingency plans and those operational decisions are enormously uh Time invest enormous time investments for for multiple agencies. So my I, I'm obviously not asking you for anything sensitive, but what should we think of as that date? What's the date after which the agencies have to start thinking about? Um, hey, we don't know this is happening. We need we need to start making technical changes, uh, winding programs down, having contingency plans right. in place. Well, so that's a great point because people don't necessarily realize how disruptive these sunsets can be to planning. That, you know, that there's, it's not really an option just to pull the plug at, at midnight and, and you need to start... Go back to Title I. Yeah, yeah, you need to start planning for this in advance. Um, I don't know the date. I, I, you know, I, I, I would expect that there's people thinking about that now, you know, uh, the career folks at NSA and DOJ and FBI, uh, particularly in the legal offices, are thinking, you know, how, what, what do we need to be planning for in, in case this does uh, expire? Now, at the same time, I'd have to go back and read carefully, and I'm sure there are folks in this room who know this uh, better than I do, but there are, there are ways to think about the statute and the authorizations that have been um, granted that might allow for there to be continued um, collection after January 1st in the absence of a statute. You mean I don't know that. I'd have to go back and really carefully read it to see, but I think that there are provisions that would allow for that. I think that's right, because I think what, the, what actually expires is the authority to seek new orders. Right. And so I think you could, if you, if you went in on the right date in December and the FISA court authorized an order... Uh, December 31st, you could imagine that order having a year of life or six months of life beyond the expiration of the statute. Uh, but that, of course, assumes you know what the court's going to do. 
Yeah, and that said, even with that, you are still then having to deal with uh, providers right. who are going to be very, uh, they're, going to be, they're not going to be too keen about an, ex- about an expired law, but an existing authorization and, you know, trying to convince them that this is all, uh, that, they're, that they're covered, basically, um, in, in complying. So, just- so, so it's, a, it's a kind of a nightmare scenario, although it's not, we kind of went through that with the Protect America Act in 2007, 2008. So before we turn to uh, what possible compromises look like in your judgment, I'm just interested in how controversial within the, within the community what you've described today is, and what, for that matter, what I've described today is. As in, you know, there's a, there's a national debate about these authorities. Are they a good thing? Are they a bad thing? Are they too broad? Do we need... But within the community, is there any disagreement that it would be a disaster if this authority lapsed? I mean, I hate to speak for the entire community, but I really don't think so. I don't know if there, I don't know of of an issue or an authority around which there's so much consensus as to its value than this. And so my own sense is that there, that this is a, you know, a just, there's really no dissent within the community about the value of 702. Um, Yeah. Uh, So I, I think it's, I think it's basically, that's the, and that it's, that it's a, and, and that it's, that it's, that it's well regulated, you know, like again, compared to a lot of other authorities, you know, this is in 2008, this, as I mentioned, was passed with a lot of, uh, compromise built in, in order to, to address concerns around, uh, privacy and civil liberties. Okay. So now we've got, um, the community wants a clean reauth. Nothing in Congress is clean these days. And, uh, my assumption is just as with the protect, uh, not the protect, sorry, the USA Freedom Act, there's going to have to be some compromises of some kind to get it done, if only to give people a face-saving opportunity to vote for something or not to hold it up. So the question is, what's the realistic latitude for compromise? You know, what, what could you shave off of 702 today without damaging the underlying authority? So the, the place I would look for the, to answer that question is uh, reporting uh, and transparency, to look for ways in which the government can provide more information about how it uses the authority of 702. Uh, and I would, I would try to hold the line on sort of how, on the more operationally oriented uh, aspects of it. That, that's, you know, I don't know, I can't, I, you know, that's sort of reading the debate a bit down the road. I don't know if that's tenable, but the... You know, and I'll, I'll be specific because um, I know you're going to ask me because you're not going to let me get away with just transparency as a general <laughs> answer, probably. Um, but I think the issue that, that that does strike me as one that is that goes to the heart of some of the concerns is this notion of incidental collection, uh, and you know that, that if for for folks in the room, uh, you know, the idea that when you are uh, targeting somebody outside the United States under 702 you may collect the other side of that communication. And that, that could be a U.S. citizen uh, in the United States. And so you're not targeting that person, but you collect that end of the communication. Um, that's what we typically refer to as incidental uh, collection. Uh, and the government has not and has sort of resisted disclosing how often that happens, where a U.S. person is caught up in that. And, and, and do you think the resistance is a function? I mean, the government describes it as technically extremely difficult to describe uh, to, to describe the number of people. And by the way, I'm pretty sure I have been incidentally collected on, and I've written about that. Um, is your is your impression that the fundamental resistance to um, uh, releasing a number is that it's just very hard to calculate or is there something more to it than that? There's a couple reasons you've heard. One is that it's hard to calculate. You've also heard the argument that it, it actually is uh, you know, counter to the interests of protecting privacy because it would require the government to go in and sort of figure out is this person a U.S. person you know, and sort of dig into the communication further. Um, I think that those are probably right. I do think, that, I do think technically it would be hard. It's a resource issue like a lot of uh, reporting requirements are, but I do think that given the concern around this and this idea that this is, uh, uh, 
you know, and, and maybe I'll talk about this, but, you know, there's a sense that this is somehow counter to what the statute really is meant to authorize, which is not true, I don't think. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean. In other words, the idea that you will collect one end in the United States as a, as a consequence of targeting somebody outside the United States. So there's a sense that that's inconsistent with the purpose of the statute. Um, and therefore, you need, the, the, you know, there should be more public reporting about how often that happens. Um, I, mean, so, I think that's just wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's my view. I, that, I, 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 th- that issue was debated in 2007 and 2008, the one and in question in particular, and Congress had a lot of opportunities to limit that statute to prevent exactly that, and they passed them all up, and they did it intentionally. Right, and that's kind of what I was going to say. So that, that, I, think that's a, I think that's a myth about the statute. When somebody will say, well, it's foreign intelligence, it's really all you care about is foreign intelligence, you know, the overseas intelligence or intelligence that only in- involves somebody who is overseas. When, it, in fact, and speaking as somebody who was the recipient of this information at NCTC, we were ex- obviously, obviously extremely interested in who that person was in the United States who was, who was caught up co- communicating with somebody overseas in Yemen or Pakistan, and, and that was critical. Now, that didn't, there, there, were, there were procedures what you do with that information, but that was that was always a purpose of the statute was to identify that person in the United States. Look, and 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 having been, I, you know, so the incident in which I'm fairly certain I was the subject of incidental collection uh, involves a situation in which I got a call from the FBI warning me that I was a cybersecurity target of some actor. Now the context of the conversation. Uh, was opaque enough that I don't think it was a simple domestic criminal matter. It wasn't like somebody was, you know, an identity theft thing. My assumption was that there was some communication, uh, you know, may, may or may not be 702, in which information about me was incidentally collected on somebody's system overseas, maybe, maybe domestically, but I suspect overseas, and I got a call to warn me, you know, and... So we have this assumption that if you're the sort of subject of incidental collection, that's a reflection of, of, of a civil liberties violation. I, to the extent that this happened, and I'm you know, pretty sure that it did, um, I'm, I consider that a protection of my civil liberties, not the other way around. And I, I, I actually wonder if the incidental collection issue assumes a, a civil liberties violation in lots of situations in which actually that would not be a reasonable assumption. And that, you know, sometimes there it's affirmatively protective and sometimes it's just, it's just neutral. Yeah. And, and your, so that I, in your situation, I completely agree with you. I, I, you know, I do think, you know, that it's it, a common way in which it matters is that the, the fact that somebody, the incidental collection does, then train the FBI's focus on the person in the United States, not just to warn them that they've been potentially a victim, but then, you know, they are now the, a, a potential target of FBI scrutiny, right? Sure. So that's the sort of the, the terrorism scenario. But so folks know the, the, what happens at that point is the government, the FBI, and the lead obtains a Title I FISA or seeks to obtain a Title I FISA, seeks to establish probable cause on the person in the United States. The, the law is, it has provision after provision that prohibits the government from trying to focus on the person in the United States without getting a FISA, this sort of reverse targeting, which is prohibited in each possible um, you know, permutation that you could imagine in the statute itself. Matt Olson, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Thanks this week to the Hoover Institution for hosting the event and providing audio. As ever, our music is performed by Sophia Yan. Please do support the podcast by spreading the word and giving us a rating and review in the iTunes store. And thanks for listening.